groundbreaking work by visually impaired astronomers with the sky at night at 10. Last chance to complete the journey pole to pole now on BBC Four and Michael's hanging on till the bitter end. <laughs> Our plan to reach Antarctica by ship from Cape Town has failed. But we have discovered there is a private company which says it could get us to the pole. We must take a risk with them or go home. But their base is in South America. We're at the end of the wrong continent. There's nothing for it but to fly 6,000 miles across the Atlantic, turning our back on the 30-degree meridian. Our route goes via Rio de Janeiro and the Andes to Santiago in Chile. The Virgin is closed when I arrive in Santiago, but the view from the plinth is well worth the walk. In this well-ordered capital at the foot of the Andes, a celebration is underway. The band of the palace guards strikes up a rousing and oddly familiar refrain. <laughs> It's the president's birthday. The Chileans aren't always this nice to their leaders. 18 years ago, their own planes bombed this palace, and inside it, President Allende took his own life. Chileans may seem a bit subdued compared with other Spanish-speaking South Americans, but there are many pleasures here. I meet our local guide, Patricio, for lunch at one of the world's most elegant fish markets. Both the cuisine and the music are local. Patricio, a musician himself, gives me the lowdown on the pipes they call cana. They're difficult to play. Yes, it is indeed. It's difficult to put in tune all the little pipes, right? And it's difficult to keep um, the, the tune on because you are playing long notes and uh, you have to be a strong muscle in your stomach to keep the air going. General Pinochet, who got rid of President Allende, tried to ban these instruments as being too representative of the left. He had more success with human beings. 2,000 of those he arrested are still missing. From Santiago, it's a further 1,700 miles down the coast to the town of Punta Arenas, which lies beside the Straits of Magellan and opposite the island of Tierra del Fuego. It grew up as the safest harbour for ships making the perilous journey round Cape Horn. From its airport, Adventure Network flies the only commercial plane into Antarctica. Well, we've made it. We. Uh cross continents, we're now at the tip of South America and we're here on the appointed day for our departure from Punta Arenas, the plains behind us, but the weather conditions round here are apparently 
unlike anywhere else on Earth. And the final decision as to whether we go today or not rests with the pilot and uh, the weather station here at Punta Arenas Airport. The pilot is a Canadian, Bruce Alcorn. His plane cannot put down for long in the intense cold of Antarctica. He can only fly out when he knows he can get back. He's looking for 18 hours of continuous good weather. There seem to be a lot of uh, low pressure areas on this map. Is that common in Antarctica? It's a phenomena of the, the South Polar regions. And uh, back here a few pages, a few days ago, is a classic example. I don't know if you can, well, you can see it here, but uh, just in the area here, we have two, three, four, five low pressure areas in an area that normally would only maybe have one or two maximum other parts of the world. So we're not going today? We're definitely not going today. And when will you know enough? When will you make your decision about tomorrow? At 7.30 tomorrow morning. We have a schedule at 7 o'clock in the morning with Patriot Hills to get their actual weather. And I'll come over here at about 7.15, see what, what the weatherman thinks and look at the satellite again. Based on that, we'll make a decision by 7.30. What do you estimate the chances at the moment? 50-50 at this time. If you're a gambler, I'll give you a little better odds. <laughs> Whilst the DC-6 waits for the weather, I find out more about Adventure Network from the local manager, Anne Kershaw. Have you ever had to abandon an expedition altogether? Once in the, in the early years, I think 1985, um, people were, had planned a sort of three-week trip, and after two and a half weeks of being in Pontarinas with bad weather, we decided to abandon it. The only remotely encouraging piece of advice I'm given is to go to the main square and visit the statue of Ferdinand Magellan, who led the world's first circumnavigation. If I want to be sure of returning safely from my journey, I must kiss the Indian's foot. Well, now I can get back safely, but when can I go? Patriot Hills, Patriot Hills, Romeo Bravo. Okay, I checked. Ten Zulu weather is 15,000 scattered, 20,000 broken. If you want to know the conditions in Antarctica, you must call up someone already there. There's no high-tech weather satellite, just the radio. Okay, copy all. Uh, Bruce plan, Bruce's plan as of this moment is to fly. The DC-6 will fly. Planning uh, wheels off, 11 local. How copy? This is the news we've been waiting for. Back at the airfield, the engineers can start putting the plane together. Bruce's DC-6 was first put together in 1953. In aviation terms, it's a geriatric, taking on one of the most demanding journeys in the world. I've taken some risks to get this far, but none have made me quite so nervous. Well, as you can see, we're here action stations ready to go after 24 uh, hours on the edge of our seats we're on the edge of our hotel beds in Punta Arenas we've now been told the weather is okay to fly into Antarctica um, planes have been known to turn back and there's one experienced traveler said he's been to the airport more times he's been to Antarctica so we could still have to go back but it looks as though we're off and uh, well all I can say is it's uh, it's kind of unlike any other departure we've made so far a bit alarming a bit exciting it really is a of a voyage into the unknown. Ah, well, here it goes. The adventure starts right away. Just climbing aboard is a minor feat of mountaineering. And on this airline, you have to be your own baggage handler. When all is loaded, the pilot himself shuts the door for us. All part of the service. And is the only one who knows how to do it. Half the cabin is for freight, half for passengers. There are 25 of us today. Uh, climbing out of here, I expect it to be a little bit rough. Be some turbulence over the mountains before we get over Drake Passage. The weather is generally good all the way. It's clear at Patriot Hills. And the landing at Patriot Hills is different. If you haven't experienced it before, it's, you know, the ice is a little rough. The airplane wiggles around a little bit. Lots of noise from the engines. It's quite normal. <laughs> Don't, uh, don't be concerned about it. The seat belt sign means what it says. Please, when it's on, be in your seats with the belt on. It's for a reason. I don't leave it on for, for nothing. 
And when the seatbelt signs off, you're welcome to wander around the aircraft, come up to the cockpit, one or two at a time. If you're using a flash camera up there, please warn me first. It kind of startles the hell out of me when it goes off behind my head. And uh, Willie and Rob will give you the rest of the, the evacuation stuff. And we'll see you in Patriot Hill. We'll be about seven hours and 40 minutes, I anticipate. <coughs> In case of the ditching, anybody not familiar with... Willie, the co-pilot, is, we're told, a fully qualified stuntman. It's a very easy... Bruce finally nurses us along the runway, I'm seized by an uncontrollable reluctance to part with the surface of Chile. The trouble with fear of the unknown is that you never know what the fear will be like until it's too late. Once clear of South America, we have a one and a half thousand mile journey to Adventure Network's base at Patriot Hills, Antarctica, which in turn is 600 miles from the South Pole. The flight is self-catering. It's quite liberating not to have to wait for trolleys and plastic trays. It's also much easier to meet your fellow passengers. As far as I can see, there's not a sane one among them. They range from Australian dentists who want to be mountaineers to Japanese who want to ride motorbikes to the pole. That's the way to do it. All airline cases should be like this. after setting out, we're over the pack ice. We've reached what Bruce dryly refers to as PNR, the point of no return. There is no longer enough fuel to get us back to Chile. No one says anything, but the mood in the plane changes. Public jollity turns to private contemplation. Everyone prepares themselves in their own way for what lies ahead. in-flight movies to break the mood, just in-flight maps. Rob, we've been going about five and a half hours. Uh, where are we now? All right, Michael, we've come from uh, Chile over here. Our approximate track is the uh, inked-in line. We're now south of the Antarctic Circle. Uh, we've come past the, uh, you saw the icebergs that were calved off of these, uh, sure, right. these ice shelves here. Was that, was that real coast we've flown over yet, or was that just uh, ice shelf? That's ice shelf extended from this island area on yeah. the uh, west of Alexander Island. We're now coming up into the Rani entrance area, and we'll be coming over this coast shortly, uh, and then on to uh, Mount Rex and over the pro mainland proper. Yeah. How big are the icebergs? It's hard to tell from up here. I mean, what kind of size yeah. can they be? The ones that we've been seeing have been up to a kilometer or two across. Um, again, the scale is difficult from altitude. Yeah. There was an iceberg about, I 
100 kilometers across yeah. the iceberg that you know would break off an ice shelf. Yeah. Those happen only every few years, yeah. though. Yeah. Apart from you know your base at the Patriot Hills, what else is around this this area here? Any other settlement? The next closest people would be at, at one of the scientific bases, either out on the coast or South Pole Station. Uh, at least 600 miles to the next closest humans from Patriot Hills. Yeah. We have arrived at the emptiest continent on Earth. No one lives here. An area one and a half times that of the USA is temporary home to some 3,000 scientists. The mountaineers catch a distant glimpse of their goal, Mount Vinson, 16,000 feet, the highest point in Antarctica. But the collective pulse really starts to quicken when the Patriot Hills rise toward us. These are the tips of mountains submerged beneath an ice cap 15 million years old and in places three miles thick. For Bruce, this is the most testing moment. He must put down a four-engined fixed-wheel aircraft on blue ice without using brakes. Everyone cheers madly because everyone knows what a risk we've just taken. If anything had gone wrong, there are no emergency vehicles of any kind to help us here. This is all there is at the terminal at Patriot Hills. The plane must be turned round fast. If the engines are stopped for more than two hours, they will freeze up. There's no time for a personal welcome or a helping hand onto a new and slippery continent. <laughs> the bit we'll all be warned about. <laughs> I know why. Great glass. <laughs> Ready to go back. Oh, Bruce. <laughs> the arrival of Bruce's plane is the major event at Patriot Hills. Everything needed to sustain life here comes in and goes out on the DC-6. Apart from unloading 25 passengers and all their equipment, there are also large stocks of food and supplies for the base. If bad weather set in, it could be three weeks or a month before the DC-6 is seen again. All the fuel has to be flown out here and the empty drums taken back. It makes it as expensive as Scotch whiskey. Skidoos and sledges keep up a constant shuttle of freight between plane and camp. The rest of us, the human freight, walk. Conditions are good today. It's high summer and the temperature has soared to minus six centigrade. I don't know quite what I expected to find at the Patriot Hills base, but 
I think it was more than this. Next morning, after a calm night of unbroken sunshine, I take my first faltering steps in the art of Antarctic survival. The first thing I learn is that here in this ice desert, even the most mundane human tasks take on an epic quality. is the most extraordinary view from any lavatory anywhere in the world. I mean, it's just amazing. I'm probably the only person sitting on the toilet for the next thousand miles. Well, it doesn't matter there's no roof on it. I'd like to spend my whole life here. It's probably bloody cold. You can't really hang around on these things. The interesting fact is that all human waste has to be removed from Antarctica. You're not allowed to leave anything here. So anything I may pass today will be air freighted out to Chile, <laughs> where it's made into models and sold. <laughs> the duty-free shop there. Makes you think. Better be a good one. Patriot Hills base is a unique gateway, distributing adventurers to every part of Antarctica. Shinji Kazama from Japan hopes to be the first person to reach the South Pole by motorbike. He's already ridden to the North Pole and halfway up Everest. He's accompanied by that indispensable aid to 20th century travel, a camera crew. While Kazama tests the snow surface, the doctors, dentists and accountants of Australia and New Zealand prepare to be airlifted out to Mount Vinson. One of their leaders is Peter Hillary, son of Sir Edmund Hillary, one of the first two men to climb Everest. But just the, the actual logistics of an expedition like this, I mean, like catering. Give us a day's menu, what it might be like. Oh, it's a sumptuous variety <laughs> of porridge in the morning and crackers for lunch and rice for dinner. I mean, doesn't that really sound a cordon bleu meal? How do you get people to sign up for this expedition? Well, I haven't told them about <laughs> the menu yet. Can I just ask on a personal level, you're, you're very, you, you come from an illustrious sort of climbing background. Your father was the first man up Everest. What was it like when you were young? Were you given any option but to become interested in climbing or...? Well, I think, if anything, Dad really almost discouraged us from, from going to the mountains to certainly to climb. We went there skiing and things like that. So he, he really didn't particularly want any of his children to get into mountaineering. But I guess it's, it's like, say, if you're brought up in a cricket family, you have a, a, uh, a famous cricketer popping around every so often and asks the young um, myself, mm. Peter, um, if he wants to go and sort of throw a ball around in the backyard. And it's a very infectious situation. You weren't given crampons in your Christmas stocking at the age of three, or No, you? but I soon, I soon located where Dad kept all his, so I had no problem with equipment. <laughs> While the climbers board their plane, those of us left behind are served the sort of meal which Peter Hillary's party won't see for at least two weeks. Spaghetti! Over a glass of chili and wine, we compare our crazy schemes. What is so special about the bike that you're using? What's different eh? about it? What's different? The normal one? Yeah. No pollution. 
No, no, no pollution. No noise. Why is there no pollution? If you've got an engine, surely the, the exhaust must... Like those, yeah, it's about emit. special things is on it. No, they are low. Low pollution, low, yeah. low noise. Low noise? Mm. And what else? Uh, white tire and white color. <laughs> white, <laughs> white color, so then no one color. will be able to see you. <laughs> You'll disappear. A non serious question. Have you been to the North Pole and the South Pole and you've even driven your bike up Everest? What, do you, what is there left to do next? Hmm? Ah, yes, I have. Mm. Moon. Moon. <laughs> moon. You've got a motorcycle on the moon. Yes. Very You're going to have to go very fast to get the yes. uh, leap off the bike. Six. Mm. 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 Yeah. <laughs> mm. Looking round the table, you can tell the regulars from the visitors. The regulars have given up shaving. Past time and stuff. Mm. And, and that. Past time. Yeah. Because mm. is. Mm. But even the regulars aren't out here for long. The Antarctic summer lasts about four months. For the rest of the year, it's dark and intensely cold. There's no option then but to abandon the base. As head of operations, Mike Sharp explains. We just take the whole thing down, pack it all in boxes and slide it into a snow cave. It's about uh, four feet underground at the moment. It's just a big, one big massive room which we have to dig out. What happens to the planes? Well. Two of the aircraft go back north, they go all the way back up to uh, Canada, and uh, the third one's a Cessna, which we get to keep here. And uh, we just dig a big hole for it and, and bury it. The only thing that's sticking out is the tail. We cover it in boards and planks and canvas things. Um, it's very good, it's very successful. We take, we'd actually take the skis and the legs off and lower it onto a sled to slide it into this monster hole. And then when we come back the next year, we just drag it back out again, put the skis on, and away we go and uh, gets a certificate of airworthiness as soon as it comes out. We get have an engineer in to check it and make sure everything's OK, and then we're away again. Last season, they weren't so lucky. An oil drum driven by the bitingly strong winds took the tail off one of the planes. A replacement just flown in is being fitted by Bill Alicook, a man of the Arctic. Major surgery. How long have you been down in the Antarctic? I've uh, been down here uh, since the um, 15th of November here at Patriot Hills and um, uh, actually this is the first time I've been to the Antarctic, um, Antarctic and um, I'm proud to say I'm probably the first Eskimo that's ever been down here so <laughs> I'm pretty proud of that. Show him how to do it. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Eh? Do you remember anything of igloo life yourself? I mean, was, were um, they still around when you were a kid? Well, I, I don't remember. I know how to build them. I, in fact, I can say, I guess, is that I was probably one of the last few that was ever born in an igloo. Amazing. Yeah. Well, you can finish the lavatory to put a roof on it. Someone <laughs> started there. Well, is that yeah. your work? Uh, no, 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 <laughs> that isn't mine. I, w I, I, I would never uh, have air conditioning. <laughs> Word is that if the weather holds, we could be going to the pole tomorrow. There's just time to ring home. OK. Hello, Helen. Can you hear me? Well, if you can hear me, that's fine. All I get from you is a, noise, a rather strange bird-like noise, but, but if that's your reply, that's great. I just rang to say that I'm in the Patriot Hills in Antarctica, 600 miles from the pole. Are you impressed? <laughs> Definitely very impressed. I was always one at pulling the birds. Well, it's just to say that we're going to the pole tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we're leaving here about five and we'll be staying there maybe 36, 48 hours. Uh, over. Yes, I have got clean underwear. <laughs> eight degrees, um, it'll be about minus 25 at the pole. I'm a bit worried as I only have um, one set of thermal underwear, but apart from that, um, I hope I will um, do the family proud. How are you? <laughs> are you? Well, I think you should try using the other one. Well, it's now about 6.30 on the day we're due to leave for the pole. 
and uh, as you can probably hear, the wind, which we haven't heard recently, has suddenly got up and it sounds very much as though the weather could be changing out there and I wonder whether it will affect our chances of leaving today. So I suppose we're going to find out what's going on. With the wind comes a vicious drop in temperature. But what's important is not how conditions are here, but how they are at the pole. Mike Sharp calls up the American base there. Yeah, South Pole, Patriot Hills. How is your present weather over? It may sound like Marconi's first broadcast, but this is a voice from the pole itself. I just pray that whatever he's saying, it's good news. It is. High pressure over the pole, and as the wind suddenly drops, there's nothing more to keep us here. First to take advantage of the improvement is Kazama, with the message he hopes to nail to the pole, though he doesn't quite know what it says. <laughs> I can't eat it. His backup team works almost casually. They could be planning a trip to the supermarket instead of a month on the ice. As if saying goodbye might be tempting fate, there's little ceremony as Kazama and his team ride off into the never setting sun. Their departure makes my feet even itchier, but it's late in the afternoon before our turn comes to load up. This tiny plane will be carrying seven people, fuel drums and survival equipment. It's a single-engined Otter of 1950s design, and this is the single engine that will take us to the pole. I seek a little reassurance from our pilot, Dan Baldwin. Well, Dan, we're in your hands now. Have you a message of hope for us? Oh, yes, the weather looks good towards the pole. Couldn't have any problem. Uh, got a little wind there blowing snow, but uh, otherwise, uh, looks like it's going to be a good trip. Have you been to the pole often? Never been there. You've never been that? No. Ah. So it's a first for both of us. You know the way? I'm from the north. I'm not from down south here. <laughs> I just come down south for the winter. Yeah. To enjoy the nice weather. And this, uh, this aircraft must be a veteran of polar flight, so is it? No, this uh, will be the first trip for a turbine otter, single-engine turbine otter, to the pole. So the plane's never been to the pole. The pole plane's never You've been never there. been to the pole. We've never been to the pole. Well, I can just land you anywhere and you don't know the difference anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all in it together. It's not a wheeled aircraft, this. What are we landing on? We're landing on skis. Uh, are those trickier than wheels? No, not so much. Just uh, whether it be wheel skis or floats, they all, they're all a little different, but uh, there's not much uh, difference in landing. Okay, well, if you're optimistic, I bet you're, you're raring to go, are you? I'm raring to go. Okay, so here goes. <laughs> Last leg. I ought to feel confident, elated even, but I know from the Arctic that at the extremes of the Earth, happy endings can never be taken for granted.
Moody Driscoll, the company's other customer, only took up adventures like this in his 50s. I don't know how they did it without sunglasses. of Antarctica is a polar plateau with an average height of 10,000 feet and an average annual temperature of minus 50 centigrade. It's a five-hour flight, but there's not much time to sleep. Halfway through, we must stop and refuel. First, we have to find the fuel. A chart gives a rough position, but the precise location is marked by a bamboo pole. Dan has never been here before, nor has his co-pilot, Scott, who, it turns out, is not a pilot at all, but a doctor. Dan goes down for a closer look. No one seems to mention what happens if we don't find it. After a few abortive passes, Dan catches sight of something. We've put down at a remote spot called King's Peak. No sooner have we squeezed ourselves off the plane than we're put to work erecting a tent. Scott, the doctor, supervises Rudy and myself. It is bitterly cold. to hang on to anything that might blow because yeah, yeah, it'll be sure. a long walk to Peter Hill to get it. <laughs> well, back home does it automatically. Yeah. Return to sender. It's difficult to grip anything with these mittens on, isn't it? I'm just going to pin out one corner. Okay. okay. Holding my end up. <laughs> As we continue our passable imitation of Laurel and Hardy, Dan digs for aviation fuel. The pump works and the otter's tank fills with what we hope will be enough to see us to the pole. Get her. <sighs> what seems like several hours later, we have the tent up. 
Only then does it become apparent why we've had to put it up in the first place. Dan is leaving us here while he flies 50 miles away to drop fuel for Kazama's motorbike expedition. Watching him disappear over the mountain fills me with foreboding. I don't think I've ever had such an acute sense of being nowhere. In our nylon igloo, Scott tries to cheer us up with tales of savage weather and people being trapped for days. At last there comes the sound we've been waiting for. Watching Dan approach is one of the most comforting sights I've seen. Watching him land is one of the most terrifying. We take the tent down again, and after one last weather check, Dan sets course for the pole. These are difficult conditions in an unpressurised cabin. We're at the equivalent of 15,000 feet above sea level. Rudy especially is finding breathing hard in the thin air. Scott administers oxygen. Slowly and uncomfortably, we draw nearer to the pole. South Pole, South Pole, South Pole, 5 8 Juliet Hotel, do you copy? Over. Uh, 5 8 Juliet Hotel, South Pole. Uh, Roger, we're about uh, 15 minutes out to inbound. How's your weather? I have a couple of pieces of information for you. Uh, when you land on the skiway, uh, you'll see a number 9 marker and recommend to pull off well off the runway and park the plane there. Uh, I'll copy. Yeah, you're coming in five square there. Uh, uh, Roger, uh, that, and I've got one more little piece of information here. Uh, there is no certified runway or airfield available, and the U.S. government cannot authorize a landing. Uh, I'll copy. Uh, Roger, we copy that. Okay, uh, have a good uh, landing. And, uh, so we're brought down to Earth. The goal of our five and a half month journey is within our grasp, but the radio conversation with the base is a reminder of an awkward truth. No one really wants us here. landed at the South Pole, or at least tantalizing close. The only thing is I don't quite know where the pole is. Uh, so I'd better go and ask. This is definitely not what I expected. It's a cross between the moon and a marshalling yard in the Midwest. I see domes and aerials and dishes and pylons, but I see no pole. How ironic it is that at the centre of the world's most unspoilt wilderness, the needs of science have created a building site. But where's the pole? Perhaps it's kept indoors to stop it getting knocked over by bulldozers. 
Only one way to find out. This is the heart of the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station, established by the Americans 35 years ago. It's an extraordinary feat, proving that even at the most inhospitable place on Earth, life as we know it can survive. Outside, the temperature is 30 below. In here, they can wear Bermuda shorts and eat chili and blueberry pie. This summer, there's a record number of 120 scientists working here. One of them must know where the pole is. Well, now I know where it is, but not which one it is. Surely this can't be it, all gaudy like a fairground attraction. Thankfully not. This is what they call the ceremonial pole. Politicians who get this far like to be photographed here. At last I see it. And at last, I'm on the point of joining the select ranks of those who have done what Scott and Amundsen never did, stand on both poles. At this point, all the world's lines of longitude converge on my toe caps. It's impossible to go further south than this. Every direction you go in will be north. At this point, I can actually walk right around the world in eight seconds, as I will now demonstrate. It is the end of the world. It's also the end of our harebrained migration from north to south. I think the omens are telling us to stop. Just a while ago, the camera packed up because of the cold. And as you can tell, I'm beginning to pack up because of the cold too. It's minus. 30 degrees centigrade here, with wind chill, that's about minus 50. We're also at an elevation of 9,000 feet, so there's uh, altitude sickness to, to combat. But I think it's just that after five and a half months on the road, the body is finally saying, pack it in. When I was a boy in Sheffield, I dreamed of coming here, like my heroes, Scott and Amundsen. Now I am here, I want to celebrate. But it's not that easy. The US government doesn't encourage hospitality. While the scientists snuggle under warm blankets, we spend a bitter night, four to a tent. But I can think of no more fitting end to our pole-to-pole -pole journey than to say, I'm glad we did it this way. Reliving the best of hilarious, groundbreaking escapades, Michael Palin's Travels of a Lifetime, streaming now on BBC iPlayer. In 10 minutes, the sky at night explores beyond the visible, dramatically changing our knowledge of the universe.